I'm delighted to be here with composer Carlisle Floyd. Carlisle, welcome to San Diego, and it's good to Thank have you. you here. Thank you. Um, I'd like to take you through your career, if you don't mind, and, and uh, just uh, look back with you. And uh, you willing to prompt me? Yeah, <laughs> I'm willing to do that. <laughs> and if we can go back very far, one of the things that I've been curious about is um, your first memory of music. Do you remember what your first memory of music, what were your, your early childhood memories of music and music making in your home? Well, it had to be my mother who played the piano. And at age three, uh, I apparently uh, just pestered her unendurably, and she finally decided to start me in piano lessons. And that didn't last very long at all. I did mean, did uh, she teach you? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, she started me then, and then she got, you know, she got all, uh, I remember the, exactly the look of the books, if you can imagine it. But uh, as I said, it just didn't work because I, you know, I wanted to play the piano. I didn't want to have to work at it like this. And so uh, that's my first memories of it, though, just being fascinated by the sounds of the piano. Mm -hmm. you, but then you, I didn't start back playing the piano until I was about 10. Uh, oh, so you didn't continue from no, early childhood? No, 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 no. Uh, uh, because, I mean, I was three years old, and my interest simply, I'm sure, vanished very quickly once I realized what was involved. But then uh, I think it was an experience that she didn't want to repeat with me. She was a pianist, and we moved around so much, it was not always easy to find a, a piano teacher that she felt was reputable. Um, and then I began, they began, to, they gave my sister piano lessons, that's what it was. And my father thought I should also have them again. But before that, I had already started playing by ear a great deal. Ah, uh, very dangerous, playing by ear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that finally convinced her that she may as well go ahead and, and start me again. And at that time, I really wanted to do it. And so I, I moved very quickly then as a pianist. But that was about 10 years, when I was 10. Now, you went to Converse, Converse College, College mm -hmm. in South Carolina? That's right. Uh, and you studied there uh, piano with Ernst Bacon. Uh, and then you followed him to Syracuse University, where you finished up your bachelor's or yeah, bachelor's. Bachelor's. Now, tell us a little bit about Ernst Bacon. Well, I think he was a very strong influence on me. And as a matter of fact, uh, I'm frequently asked by <clears throat> by press people and media people, uh, "How did you ever get into American opera? How did, why did you ever think you wanted to get into it?" And I have to just say that the um, the impetus was really him. Uh, because he belonged to that com uh, group of composers in the 30s and 40s in America who were self-consciously and, and um, just enthusiastically uh, chauvinistic about creating an American musical sound mm -hmm. or creating native, uh, native uh, culture. Uh, it was very interesting because he was more overboard in, in terms of being an American than I was. And I had, you know, I, my forebears had lived here for two or three hundred years, and his mother was an Austrian countess. Mm -hmm. But uh, nonetheless, they're the, therefore the Ernst. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, um, he liked, I think, Roy Harris, uh, certainly Copeland. Uh, Howard Hansen. Howard, Howard Hansen less so, mm -hmm. but was strenuously American, so much so that, that uh, Ernst um, discouraged, I won't say for bad, but it was close to that, discouraged my using, ever using uh, Italian tempo markings if I wrote something. Oh, song. really? Yeah. Everything had to be Everything in English? Everything had to be in English. Interesting. Um, I, but I think that kind of uh, overly strenuous uh, enthusiasm for one's own native culture always happens when a, when a country is trying to stamp, make, uh, make its own uh, art felt in a very native way. I mean, the same thing happened, obviously, in Czechoslovakia with, with Smetna and, and, uh, and Janacek, uh, and certainly in Russia. So but you studied uh, composition as well as piano with? Not really. Mm -hmm. I had one semester of composition with him, mm -hmm. uh, which basically was, um, do what you want to do. <laughs> uh, and, but I think it was very valuable uh, in the sense that he encouraged me to follow my own ear and my own instincts yeah. rather than become in any way an academic. He was very anti-academic uh, without ever saying so, but it very, he made it very clear to me that, his, uh, that this was an art and that there were no rules. But it was rather like throwing you into the pool and, and expecting saying, you yeah, to and swim. Absolutely. Yeah. And, but I think th that kind of freedom was enormously important. And, and I have him uh, to credit for really adopting an attitude that I've maintained through my professional life. I mean, it's not always easy to simply 
follow your own instincts and your own inner ear uh, when there's many pressures in schools of composition as there are and were back in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Now, being essentially a, a composer of dramatic music, uh, and I know that you have an abiding love of theater, can you think back what were some of the seminal theatrical experiences for you, either as an audience member or as a as a, pers a participant in theater? Well, I started going to the theater when I went to Syracuse with Ernst Bacon. Uh, I would go to the theater in New York any time I had the chance. In which I was, and when I was a very young faculty member at Florida State University, every vacation I went to New York. And I went to the theater constantly. I must say, I never went to the opera house. <laughs> That's very, interesting. Very rarely. Yeah. Uh, but my training was as a pianist. and. That, yeah, I went to piano recitals or to hear pianists I admired, and singers, I must say. Um, but the opera, but the opera in, 19, in the 1940s and 50s was very, very traditional. First of all, we only had about three companies in the country uh, who did standard seasons, and it just didn't interest me a great deal theatrically. Uh, but when Giancarlo Minotti came on the scene uh, in the late 40s and early 50s, uh, that, that triggered my interest in opera and musical theater because it demonstrated that there, uh, there, there had been a return to theatrical values in opera. And so I, along with many of my uh, colleagues there uh, at that time, Douglas Moore, who was a great deal older than I was, but Robert Ward, really felt, certainly I felt, that there was a much wider audience for opera than had been tapped at that time and that we could tap into. Now, speaking of Susanna, this was your first uh, critical and artistic success, I would say, uh, uh, written in <laughs> Without any question, 1955, yes. Yes. Uh, and then it was taken up by New York City Opera a couple of years later? Eighteen months later, yeah, after its now, initial performance. Now, but my, my question, before we talk about Susanna, is were there operas prior to that? Yeah. And where are they? <laughs> Well, the first was a one-act opera that I, I wrote as a graduate pro, uh, project when I was studying composition with Ernst Bacon, a uh, one-act opera called Slow Dusk, uh, which is still done in workshops around it. It's, it's published. It was published after Susanna was performed, and it's done pretty much year in and year out, not on a, a great basis, but it's done in colleges primarily. Mm -hmm. And then I did a second work, uh, which is the one you're smiling about, <laughs> uh, <coughs> mysteriously called Fugitives. Uh, which was a disaster. And uh, people say, where is it? And I said, it's hidden. <laughs> I've never let Boozy and Hawk see it or anybody else. It's, it's, uh, it's in a safe, as a matter of fact. Oh, goodness. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, we'll never see, uh, ever be seen again. But it was an opera like all the operas that fail, if you're at all thoughtful. Uh, I learned a tremendous amount from. Oh, I'm sure. Tremendous yeah. amount from the failure. Well, you have to, don't you? You I mean, have from, to. From something like yeah. that. I uh, love, you know, um, Harold Clorman's wonderful statement that the failure is the manure for success, you know, and I think it's, he's absolutely right. And certainly that, that taught me what you can do on the, the, the uh, musical st st stage and what you can't do. So that's, that's the very uh, the mysterious unknown opera that has never seen the light of day. Since now, then. now, New York City Opera picking up Susanna, was that a surprise to you? Or did uh, you know when it was first performed in Florida that, uh, that they were going to pick it up? Oh, no. No. Um, the reason it was picked up by New York City Opera was, was the efforts of, of Phyllis Curtin, who was at that time the leading soprano, and uh, who had just very graciously uh, consented to, to come to Tallahassee and do the original Susanna production there with a student cast and student orchestra. But she and Mac Harrell, her colleague, a magnificent bass baritone, they came uh, and did the world premiere in Tallahassee. We auditioned it initially for City Opera because, that, as I said, that's where Phyllis, that was her artistic home. And uh, the then general director of the company, Rosenstock, uh, liked the piece but said, I really can't do it. So he, in a sense, turned it down, in effect turned it down. And then he was dismissed and replaced by Eric Leinsdorf, the conductor, uh, who had one season at the New York City Opera. But we went out to his home in Larchmont, and we went through the whole opera again. Phyllis, uh, God bless her, uh, she sang every role in the opera. 
<laughs> if, if Mac Carroll wasn't there, she did Blitch. Uh, she sang all the chorus parts, everything. Wow. And uh, it was on the basis of that audition with Leinsdorf that he agreed to put it into the season that fall. And did he conduct it? He conducted it. That's yes. wonderful. So that was the beginning and launching of Susanna. And uh, it was due to her efforts because certainly my name would not have opened any doors in New York in those days. And, uh, but she was indefatigable. Hmm. Well, now you've had a lengthy relationship with San Diego Opera. Yes, we did one of my happiest. There you go. We we did uh, Susanna in 1981, yes. and I rem I recall that the cast include Patricia Craig as Susanna and Richard Cassily uh -huh. as Sam, I believe, and a very young Samuel Ramey. Very young in Samuel the Ramey doing his first Olin Blitch. Olin Blitch. Now you directed and that. Carlisle Floyd staging it. There yes, you go. That's right. Now did you? Why, why did you choose to also direct many of your, of your operas at, 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 in regional companies? Well, Phyllis and Norman got me into it. The first time I ever did it was in, in New Orleans in 1960, where they performed it with Cassily. As a matter of fact, it's the production that's, that's now um, on the archival recording, the VAI yes, archival right, recording. Right. And they urged me to stage it. And I said, but I've never really staged an opera. But as a matter of fact, I did stage the, un, uh, the unnameable opera, Fugitives, uh, as a matter of fact. But I said, but I've never really st I, I've staged an opera. I've, I've seen, obviously, I had by that time seen the opera staged in New York uh, once or twice by directors that I was not all that enthusiastic about, I have to say. And so what I did was to simply bone up on everything I could about stage directing. And it's like composition in a way. Uh, there are certain technical things that you learn in the strong parts of the stage. You try to develop an eye for, for composition, those things. But the rest of it's up to instinct. And you either have a gift for it, which you then refine by doing it. Um, so I did it with them very assiduously. I mean, everything was charted to the nth degree. Uh, and once I got started, I found it very exciting to do. And at least, you know, for better or worse, it came out as I saw it. Mm -hmm. Well, so I did. Gosh, I don't know how many productions I have done by now. But you, you, you continued to do it, so you yeah. must you must have enjoyed it. Yeah, it's very different from composing. It's sure. certainly different from doing the libretto. And I love working with actors, and it was something I I felt maybe wrong, but I felt that I had a really a gift for working with actors. Uh, and, and also for creating something that was very alive on the stage. Now we've also it's too much work now, though. I think. Yeah, <laughs> we've also done the Passion of Jonathan Wade, uh, not once but twice, and uh, and it, it's, which is a, a wonderful work about the Reconstruction era after the Civil War. Again, a, an extremely strong cast with with folks like Cheryl Woods and Eric Parse, wonderful. Uh, young baritone, and I don't think anyone who saw Jonathan Wade will ever forget the spiritual that you wrote for the soprano de Bri Brown. Yeah. What um, what was it that that brought you to that story? Now, I is it based on real events? No, or? no, it was a, it was suggested to me by my wife. Really? Yes, just an idea. It was on a train ride we took to New York. And I don't know where she got it from. She's never told me. But she said, you know, what about doing an opera based on a Union officer during the Reconstruction in the South? With all the tensions and, 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 and pulls that that must have involved, I mean, with, with, uh, with the man of conscience. And uh, it's like anything else, you know. It's, it, the bells go off if, if you're suggested, uh, if somebody suggests something to you, this way Susanna happened initially. I thought, uh-huh, you know. Most of the things that people suggest, you know, I just say politely, thank you. You know, <laughs> I'll consider that. And I realize that nothing, <laughs> there's been no response on my part at all. But that's all really she suggested. And uh, then I took it from there and did an awful lot of reading and research on the period. Uh, I didn't want it to be, you know, in any way an academic exercise, but I wanted to be true to the period mm -hmm. because it's certainly a very theatrical period, oh, to say the least. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I did the version that was commissioned by the New York City Opera in 1962, uh, which had a very mixed response, but a very, very positive audience response. But then you returned to it and mm -hmm. revised it considerably. Now, as I recall, when you were here uh, before, that you essentially took the opera and rewrote 
what, 70%? Uh, yeah, about 70% oh, of, of the music, yeah. and uh, I would say about 40% of the libretto, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I only, I smile because when I accepted the commission to, to do a revision, I thought it would be a revision. <laughs> and little did I expect it was going to turn into a wholesale rewrite, which is what it really ended up being. But it was simply the inevitable product of there being almost 30 years in between. Uh, and musically, my idiom had changed somewhat. Certainly, I th felt that I was in, in, uh, had greater skills as a librettist because it's a big subject, as you know. It's the largest scaled opera I've ever attempted in terms of the number of the people involved, and yet I didn't want it to be just purely an epic. Uh, and I think, that, frankly, I had to do the first version in a very large hurry because of the commission for the city opera. So there was never time to rethink and to reconsider. At the time, we simply had to get it on. All we could do was to cut, if needed, you know. So, but I never had time to sit back and really evaluate the piece. Uh, and so I welcomed the opportunity to come back to it after all those years. I always thought I probably would because the audience response in New York was quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. the, um, the Groves Dictionary again. Must be interesting, um, having a biography. <laughs> yeah, people are always reciting the, the Groves Dictionary to me, and I don't know what it is. Yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I know what it is, but I've never looked at the entry, so tell me. Well, it's, it's fascinating because, of course, it lists uh, all of your operas at the end of the bio biography, and uh, by count at the printing of that book in 1980, there were 11 operas. It included Willie Stark. After Willie Stark is called Sassy Tree, is that right? Is there well, the rewrite of Jonathan and the Wade. Re and the rewrite yeah. of Wade. So mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about an oeuvre of, of 12 operas. Out of those, are there any that, um, that you feel you would really like to see again with a top-notch professional uh, yeah. attention? Yes. that you don't feel it got the first time around, a, a, a piece that, that you would really love to see produced. Yeah. And Bilby's Doll. That? Bilby's Doll. Mm -hmm. And this is based on? It's based on an, a remarkable novel by Esther Forbes, the New England historian, um, who wrote a very popular novel called Paul Rever Revere, The World He Lived In. Uh, and she did this very little known book, although still published in paperback, called A Mirror for Witches, which was her take on the Salem period, a very different treatment of the witch trials, the witchcraft period in Salem, uh, which was brought to me by, of all people, a Broadway producer after Susanna was first done in New York, and they wanted to do a Broadway musical out of it. And I was engaged to do both book, music, lyrics, the whole, the whole thing, although I never thought it was going to be a Broadway musical. But, but they were, and I, I said to them when they came to me, I said, why do you want me to do it? I said, I don't write 32 major hit tunes. I can, but it's not what I really want to do. And they said, no, we want what you want to do. Well, I mean, to make a long story short, the project died a morning, although they, could, they had assembled a marvelous production staff for it because the material was basically too, too serious for Broadway. And also, it didn't lend itself to a musical comedy idiom at all. But it's a remarkable story. And I, I was thinking about it just last night, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's never, I won't say it's never had the popular success because it's never really been done except twice. But I made wholesale revisions. I took almost an hour after, out of the music. Uh, the, the performing edition now exists, but it's probably almost, I would say close to an hour shorter than it was initially. And therefore, I think much more compact, much, to the po uh, much more to the point. And I did a great deal of rewriting of the piece between the, its initial production in Houston and its second production in Omaha, initially. And then I did a production, or supervised a production, at the University of Houston about four or five years ago that was just simply, it was very generous of them. They did a production so that I could finally get a performing version that I wanted to publish. So that's the one that exists now. And uh, the subject matter is different from the kind of thing that I normally do, but it's a very earthy, but on the other hand, it's also, it's, it has its surreal elements almost. But it's a very different treatment of the witch trials. And uh, Patricia Reset would do a marvelous doll Bilby. I was very fortunate in having an, another wonderful all-star cast because Catherine Mal Malfitano did the first doll Bilby. Ah. She was a remarkable. Oh, sure and Alan Titus and uh, Sam Raimi, it was when they were all just beginning their careers. Terrific.
I want to turn, um, b before we run out of time, particularly to a moment that I think was one of San Diego Opera's greatest moments, and that was our production of, of Mice and Men, again with Eric Pars as George and the incomparable tenor, uh, Anthony Dean Griffey, as Lenny. Were you as bowled over and delighted with that oh, production as we were? Absolutely. No, I really, I think I told Ian Cameron that I thought it was the finest production overall I'd seen of it, of Mice and Men. It's uh, a very powerful piece. It was an absolutely riveting, dramatic experience as well as uh, a wonderfully satisfying musical evening. That's been, fortunately, the experience really since the opera was first done. It's, uh, it's, it's always, to say the least, heartening. <laughs> and, it's, um, and your style has changed. And this was written in, in the 70s. Is 1970, that right? yeah. 1970. And it's a little thornier, I think, mm -hmm. harmonically, a little bit more dissonant. Of course, it matches the story of, of, of the Stein book. No, as a matter of fact, I'm glad you brought that up, Nick, because it's the kind of thing that I never really get to talk about very much. But, I mean, that's changes in idiom, which are a natural evolution of a style, I hope. Uh, I've, never, I, I've never wanted to make arbitrary d changes just for the sake of changing an idiom. But I hope that one seeks a, a wider harmonic vocabulary, more rhythmic interest, all of those things. But uh, the two operas that came together were Of Mice and Men and Bilby's Doll. And I think that they're, they're the most, and I say, when I say advanced, I'm using the term very relatively, but in terms of harmonic idiom, uh, they're the most two complex operas I've written in terms of harmonic idiom and also rhythmic idiom. Mm -hmm. So my hearing is not completely Anything off. Anything but. I've no, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's uh, well, I felt that the two huge elements in A Mice and Men, and as a musical dramatist, whatever idiom you choose has to serve the material, obviously, and is really dictated by that. But I mean, I felt that the opposing things in Mice and Men were on the one hand, the lyricism and gentleness of, of the dream of George and Lenny, and also their basic relationship, and, and the, the, uh, the prickly, sinister forces really outside their particular world. Uh, and also, it's a violent story. Uh, despite all the tenderness in it, there's so much anger, so, so much hostility, and, and uh, but at the heart of it is something else quite, quite beautiful. So I felt that the more I could heighten those extremes, uh, and the more I could explore a harmonic world that I hadn't until that time, the better. And now, of course, for something completely different, <laughs> Cold so, Sassy right. Tree, Absolutely. which uh, of all of your operas probably has more comic moments. In no, it without any question. Than any other. What was it about the, the property of Olive Ann Burns' novel that attracted you to, to this as being potential fodder for theater music, for, for, for music theater, for opera? The characters, uh, which are wonderfully drawn, very vivid, um, larger than life in their way. Uh, also the situation, the basic dramatic premise, as we know of, of the book in which uh, a, a very crusty uh, individualist decides to flout, I don't say he decides, he just does it, uh, public opinion and, uh, and the town he lives in by remarrying three weeks after his first wife dies and to a woman half his age. Uh, that's already wonderful fodder. I mean, that's, that's your n nut in a sense it, from which everything else derives. Uh, and the fact that I thought, thought it was a beautiful study of a relationship evolving between two people who's, who have absolutely no idea or don't envision the relationship going the way it goes, which is fascinating in itself because it's also profoundly human. Do the characters dictate that to you? Is it rather like a novelist looking for the right language, the right tone that comes out of the character in a novel? Do, do you feel you're doing the same thing musically? Do they tell you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and when it comes down, what it comes down to is something that in, in discussion sounds almost simplistic. But the, just the personality of, for instance, of Rucker, the leading character, from the beginning, uh, uh, the motive that's connected with him from the very beginning is something extremely uh, uh, resolute, forceful, powerful, always certainly in 4-4 four, four time. He could never be in 3-4 or 6-8 time. Uh, but everything that, uh, that, all of those things feed into the computer, I mean, into the idiom. It's something that 
forceful, dynamic, uh, easy, that immediately grabs your attention. Uh, and then when you get into the lyrical side of, of love, then you get into your triple meter. It's something, uh, well, depending on what, what she's saying at the moment, when she's in her first long lament. This is Love Simpson. Rooms. Yes, Love Simpson. Yeah. Uh, what, what was interesting, and I, uh, because I told Pat Reset about this in, initially, and I'll, I'll say it at this point for public record, what's, what's marvelous as a musical dramatist, if you do your own libretto, is when you write the music and suddenly the music changes the characters or shows them in a different light. Or I have found characters that I never thought were terribly strong as personalities, yet as soon as they began to uh, get musical clothing, they became much stronger personalities. Mm -hmm. The thing I found in love was an enormously deep sadness in, in the woman, uh, which I knew was there basically in a way, but I didn't until I started writing her music. And I don't mean to sound mystical about it, but it, it, the point is that the character uh, reveals them, their essences, because that's what you're dealing with with the music. That's what the music can tell you all the time. You said something that's, that struck a nerve with me, and that is that sometimes, or maybe all the time, in, in theater or in opera, the more the composer puts you at a distance from what's, what's going on, the more the audience is really attracted uh, and enmeshed emotionally uh, in the story. Well, music is so, so, uh, this is the, uh, sounds so banal to say it, but it's such a potent force. And it's immediate when you're talking about musical characterization. We're not talking about a paragraph. We're talking about something that can occur in four measures. And you have the essence of a character. I mean, that's that's what you have to dedicate yourself to as a musical dramatist, coming up with a material that nails the moment uh, or the character. And it's so fast, and it's so undeniable if it's done well, and it's and if it's not done well, it's undeniable too, because you realize that you've missed the mark. Right. Well, Carlisle, it works. <laughs> <laughs> it works beautifully, uh, and I, I, I want to say from having had the opportunity to see Cold Sassy Tree in Houston during its premiere run, it's a terrific piece. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And uh, all of the works that we've been lucky enough uh, at San Diego Opera to do of yours have been peak experiences uh, for me as an audience member, and I thank you for that, and I thank you for joining us. I cherish this very much, and thank you for your, your kindness. You're very, very kind.